Hi, I'm Abby from Yakima, Washington. The Sound of Young America is an independent production supported by listeners like you and me. If you'd like to donate to support the show, visit MaximumFun.org and click on Donate. I'm Jesse Thorne, America's radio sweetheart, and this is The Sound of Young America from MaximumFun.org. You're listening to The Sound of Young America. I'm Jesse Thorne, America's radio sweetheart. My guest, Jamie Hewlett, is the creator of the Gorillas, the cartoon band that has become wildly more popular than certainly any other cartoon band in history. Um, he's also the creator of Tank Girl, and uh, he recently won the Designer of the Year Award from the Design Museum in uh, London, England. Uh, Jamie, welcome to The Sound of Young America. How are you? Oh, very well. Thank you for having me. So in in looking at your biography and checking out the stuff you did kind of at the at the very beginning of your career um at the very beginning of Tank Girl it seems like there was always a connection in your work between your uh your graphic work and your comics work and music and I wonder how that came about like if you were a if you were a frustrated musician as a teenager or something like that mm. um no I've never had any aspirations to be a musician I've never played or, or attempted to learn to play any instruments. Um, I just, uh, I love music, so, um, and I tend to always listen to music when I'm, when I'm working, so it's sort of, it, um, it's sort of, not intentionally an, an inspiration, but it ends up being an inspiration. So, yeah, I always have, um, I used to, I mean, when I first started drawing comics years ago, I used to sort of, draw all day and all night and <clears throat> live by myself in a flat and used to listen to Tom Waits sort of constantly for sort of 24 hours and then sleep for five and then get up and do the same thing. So it's, there's always, yeah, you always listen to music and then it, it yeah, it just sort of creeps into the ideas and, and, and the style of, of what I do. How does listening to Tom Waits 24 hours a day inform... <laughs> <laughs> inform art um, um i really don't know it's very hard to um to actually pinpoint what are the um what are the things you get from and i think it's just a sort of a feeling uh, or it sort of gets you excited or sort of just sort of puts you in the mood for doing what you do i guess and you know a lot of tom waits songs he's sort of telling great stories and it's almost like yeah you know, having a story read to you Many stories read to you by Tom Waits, which is kind of quite a soothing, relaxing um, thing to have in the background while you're working. But then I, I listen to I listen to music constantly. Um, I can't uh, I can't sit there drawing in silence. I have to have um, I have to have music on, and it just sort of helps. It gets me in the mood. You know, maybe I put something loud on to get me started, and then as I sort of get into it, maybe something a bit a bit softer. And, Tank Girl was one of your first big projects, and it was kind of an extraordinary success. And I wonder what that was like for you, just as a kind of a young guy, and this creation of yours is, is just took off. I think, well, we sort of came into, um, it, it was me and a whole bunch of other young comic artists who sort of came into the English comic scene at a time when, he was going through a bit of a renaissance and um, there was a lot of old school comic artists sort of still doing the same old stuff and um, there was a big sort of, all these magazines did a big feature on this sort of group of new young comic artists who I was one of them and, you know, how we were like the sort of, the new wave sort of punk rock comic artists and I guess maybe um, we all sort of played up to that and, and the Tank Girl, which was the first comic strip that I did really. I think um, we were doing that that comic strip for a, an independent magazine, and um, 
the magazine was, was put together by people who'd never really put together a magazine before and and you know the, there was sort of no censorship or editing and we used to sort of deliver our artwork sort of the morning that it was supposed to go off to the printers so no one had a chance to check any of the scripts and stuff so it was it was quite sort of an anarchic way of of working so we used to sort of push it a bit further each time we delivered a strip and the subject matter became more and more twisted and and basically we got away with doing the sort of stuff that we might not be able to get away with anymore so the the editor didn't never have a chance to read the strips because we would turn up sort of give it to him and then it would go straight on a bike to the printers and and then the magazine would come back and they'd realize that you know it was full of foul language and and scenes of you know depravity and whatever else we felt like doing at that time so that was kind of a, a good period i don't i don't think it sort of works the same like that anymore unless you're sort of producing an underground comic but we very much were able to do exactly what we wanted to do and the magazine became popular and you know was selling well and everyone was reading it so it was you know we got a lot of complaints from mothers and fathers <laughs> who discovered the comics in their in their children's bedrooms and had actually picked it up and read it and, <laughs> and we had all kinds of weird stuff happen but um, we just got away with doing what we wanted how did it come to you to make a comic like that that was full of depravity and this kind of this heroine that was um, kind of very much known as a as a punk rock sort of heroine, which was something that you know wasn't that big in in comics at the time? No, well, we we, we consciously made the decision to 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 do a, a strip about a female character who was you know like a tough sort of in your face character, and I think after about the third issue, all these magazines were writing about you know. This 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 tank girl. She's this this great tough character, and she's really ballsy. But we felt that everybody was sort of getting the wrong end of the stick, and 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 didn't quite understand the character the way we did. And they were seeing her as just this sort of loudmouth character who drunk beer and and got in fights. And so we tried to push it in other directions by just sort of, I guess, trying to make it as outrageous as possible and trying to think up storylines that were just really childish and and, <laughs> and really rude and you know stories where she'd have to eat people's feces and stuff you know we'd just see how far we could go <laughs> before somebody said stop you're not allowed to do that and nobody ever did so we just sort of pushed it and pushed it further and further um until we sort of ran out of steam and decided we didn't really want to do it anymore <laughs> that seems like we, it would be we kind of like, exhausting. We were 21 years old, I'm just having a laugh, really. <laughs> and, <laughs> and just really, really taking the mickey out of everything else. And, you know, there, was a, there were a lot of comics around that we didn't like and a lot of characters that we didn't like. And we felt like we were sort of, you know, the anarchic side of British comics and, and we wanted to just sort of go against the grain. And, and, but we just pushed it too far. <laughs> 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 I mean, I look back on those comments and I read the, some of the stories, the language as well. I mean, using certain swear words that, that are not commonly used because they're considered <laughs> far too out. You know, like the C word, for instance, is, uh, you know, is uh, people don't use that word. They still don't use that word. You say that in conversation, people look at you and think, oh, they said the C word. We used to use that 10 or 15 times an episode, you know, as much as we could. So, uh, you know, we were being irresponsible and, and um, having fun with it, really. They're not really qualities that you would associate with comic book creators or people who sit in their room all day drawing and listening to Tom Waits, either. Well, yeah, we, we were sort of, you know, we were sort of getting drunk and, you know, smoking pot and just being just young and enjoying ourselves, really. I think that was the secret of it. And, you know, we used to make up the stories on the spot we would leave it until like three days before the deadline and then we'd just stay up for three days and just do it and um and i'd start the story before we had the end of the story and but it just seemed to sort of work i mean some of the stories are pretty rubbish <laughs> looking back on this but there, 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 there's, a, there's a handful of, of them that i think are really funny and i still really laugh and so it was um so that really got us started in that direction and then unfortunately we <clears throat> we made a film with um, Hollywood and it all went down the toilet hole. <laughs> How did you kind of, you mentioned running out of steam 
earlier. How did that kind of brash 21-year-old-ness of Tank Girl run out of steam? Well, I think it was that was when it, when, when it went to Hollywood and they made a film. And uh, we, were, we were very enthusiastic about it to start with. But we were pretty young, so we didn't really know, you know, what goes on in Hollywood. And we believed that, um, you know, we would end up with this great film that was, you know, what we, you know, what we wanted. But um, obviously, you can't you can't fight the powers of Hollywood. And the film ended up really awful. And I think at that point, we decided, right, we have to back away from this and and put this behind us. Otherwise, we're never going to work again. So we, um, that's exactly what we did. I think we, we st- I stopped drawing comics for a while and we tried a few other things and came up with other ideas that sort of never really went anywhere. And, you know, there was sort of some wilderness years where I was just doing illustrations and earning some money. But that sort of, that was like a, a, a big dent in the side of our armor, I suppose. And uh, luckily we recovered from it and, and moved on to do other stuff. But, um, you yeah, know, that was like a... That was like um, a bit of a sort of a bear trap that we accidentally stood in and, uh, you know, nearly destroyed it, destroyed our reputation over here. <laughs> but the comics remain intact and the comics remain the thing that, the Tango comics remain the thing that I'm, you know, I'm happy with and I don't really consider the film to be anything to do with me. I can imagine that after having that film come out, which was very poorly received, you know, both among Tank Girls fans and among, you know, kind of the movie going public and among critics, pretty much universally poorly received, um, that after stepping back, you would be looking at your career and being a little bit worried that maybe that high point came when you were, you know, 22 or whatever. Yeah. And it was all over. <laughs> well, that 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 that, that um, you know that could have that could have happened. That could have been you know the way it went. I mean, stuff that's happened since um, the Tango years has been has come around through you know a sort of chaotic path. It was never intended to be this way, and it's just sort of you know things happen luckily, really, and you stumble across things. And you know, I mean, there's been a lot of ideas, a lot of good ideas that we've come up with. When I say we, I. I mean the sort of various different people I've collaborated with over the years, but um, there's been a lot of ideas for TV shows and comic strips that I still think are really good, but I haven't got off the ground yet, but someday maybe I will. But, um, yeah, I think we convinced ourselves after after the Tank Girl film, I think we convinced ourselves that um, it was all right and we shouldn't feel bad about it because Tank Girl was the sort of character who who probably would sell out really badly like that and make a <laughs> film because that's, what, you know, that's just how unpredictable we were. And, you know, so what was, <laughs> was our attitude? We were going to have her killed off. Uh, and she was going to get one over by a milk float while going out to get, <laughs> going out to get a newspaper from the news agents. We, you know, we wanted to come up with a really unspectacular end for the character. And, uh, and that was the film. But we didn't even realize that we'd done it. So <laughs> until, you know, six months afterwards when we were licking our wounds and feeling bad about it. And then we just sort of said, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter. Whatever. It's time to move on and, and do something else. And it's actually an appropriate end to a character like Tenko. You're listening to The Sound of Young America. My guest is artist, illustrator, designer, and Gorillaz co-creator, Jamie Hewlett. We'll be back in just a moment. The latest podcast from MaximumFun.org is Jordan Jesse Go, a weekly masterclass on things that are awesome. This week we heard Patton Oswalt's Top 5 Things of 2006, Jordan's Top 5 Video Games Under $20, and sketch comedy duo Clifford and Kid's Top 5 Chocolate Bars. Search for Jordan Jesse Go in iTunes or visit MaximumFun.org to subscribe today. The Sound of Young America Forum is now open for business at MaximumFun.org. Join other listeners and yours truly in discussing the latest shows or the latest happenings in culture and the arts. Just visit MaximumFun.org and click on Forum. This is The Sound of Young America. I'm Jesse Thorne. We return now to my chat with Jamie Hewlett. When I read... uh, how you and Damon Albarn created 
the gorillas. The thing that struck me was less the fact that you were creating this, um, you know, now cultural icon or whatever, but more the fact that um, I just didn't realize that uh, rock and roll stars had flatmates. <laughs> I thought they all lived in like hammer, like houses like Hammer's House in Oakland with like gold, <laughs> gold ceilings and stuff like that. Yeah, well, that's um, that's American rock stars, <laughs> English rock stars. Um, well, it, 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 yeah, it, it just sort of came about that we um, we just shared a flat for some reason. I think um, we'd known each other for a, a, a long time anyway, and just by a complete a complete sort of fluke, we ended up sort of hanging out and and then ended up sharing a flat which was never on the cards and you know i never would have expected that that was going to happen but it just sort of did through some sort of chaotic occurrence and um and that's when we sort of came up with the idea so it's you, you, you never really know what's what's around the corner what what's going to happen next and, and weird things happen and and then we're sitting there coming up with this idea that that we think we thought could be quite successful if we if we actually put some effort into it and it, it took off, so it was it was it was a lucky it was lucky that we ended up in that position and allowed ourselves to sort of have that idea. Something that strikes me about the gorillas is that it, there's an element of it that's almost like a um, that's almost a parody of rock stars and, and rock star culture and rock and roll culture, um, and. It's remarkable to me that something that has that parodic element, and it's certainly not all of it, but there that is part of it, um, would become such a kind of a mainstream phenomenon. Mm. Well, I think it's, it's got a lot to do with the fact that uh, a lot of contemporary music is made up anyway. I mean, there's very few truly, truly original bands or artists or singers emerging anymore i mean it, almost everything can be traced to something that happened 10 years ago that can then in turn be traced to something that happened 10 years before that do you know what i mean it's um there doesn't appear to me to be any really really original new stars coming out and and so much of it is, is it just seems made up to me i don't believe these bands that i see on the tv i don't believe in them i don't it's not like the days of when you used to listen to The Clash or The Specials or, or even like a band like The Sex Pistols where there was something about each member of the band that was interesting and and you believed that, you know, you believed in them. And I don't, I don't get that feeling anymore. I think it's all really false and contrived. And uh, so th- that just seemed to be the logical step with Gorillaz. Well, you know, let's make it up, but let, let's make it up and make it really good. And let's cut out that sort of that celebrity element that everyone seems to be so concerned with, you know, wanting to be, I, I'm a famous pop star, and look at me being photographed, looking like I've taken those drugs and I find my life is too hard, I have to write a pop song. Uh, it's all just rubbish. And um, we just love the idea of, 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 of creating this false band that could be more outrageous than any other living band and then by doing that, allowing ourselves to create a world where we could collaborate with as many people as we wanted to. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we could collaborate with anybody. And suddenly what we, what we found ourselves with was this, was this uh, sort of network of people who were all working and contributing towards this, this fake band who were the, who were the front men of the band, these four characters who didn't exist. But behind the scenes, there's all these wonderful, talented people who are wanting to be involved because they love the idea and they've got something to contribute as opposed to wanting to be involved because they want to be known for it or photographed for doing it. Do you know what I mean? One of the things about the band that's interesting to me is the way that having these cartoon characters... Um, that these cartoon characters really aren't avatars for real life people, but are in fact kind of exist in this separate world. And, and some of the characters are, have contributions that come from multiple different real life people. Mm. Mm, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's, um, 
you know, like I said earlier, there's there's no, uh, there's no true original bands around. I don't think um, I think Gorillas are an original idea for how to uh, um, put a band together. But obviously, the ingredients that have gone into Gorillas, from the music to the animation, it all comes from the sort of stuff that inspires us and the sort of stuff that's around us. I mean, you know, we reference an awful lot of stuff in the videos and on the website and through the characters. And, you know, obviously Murdoch is a, a, a mix between, you know, Keith Richards and a Scooby-Doo baddie. And you know what I mean? It's, there's, there's, <laughs> there's all these little ingredients that, 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 I mean, some of them we don't even think about. They're just sort of ingrained in, on your brain because it's something that you're into. It's interesting to me that the uh, that your response to music that um, and bands that that feel like a, a recreation of past music is to is to create this band which in a lot of ways is kind of an ultimate display of sort of pastiche in music. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, but, but but without pretending that uh, that we created it, that it's 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 you know it's it's. We, we we don't hide the fact that it's it's based on all of these things that inspire us, and it's it's a mixture of of many different um, types of music and styles of animation, and 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 you know it's got a bit of everything in there, which which I like, but also I, I think it's quite informative. And through the through the fact that it's cartoons, you have you know you kids really get into gorillas and and. And once kids get into something, you know how they they really make the effort to find out and become interested in, you know, what goes into it. And so, through that, they're learning all this sort of cool stuff about the the the, the, the music the music we reference and and the the stuff that we put on the website and 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 what our influences are and what inspires us. And I think that's a good thing. Instead of you know being a band who sort of play music that sounds a lot like the Rolling Stones and want to look a bit like the Rolling Stones, but they aren't the Rolling Stones. <laughs> They're just a very bad copy. What? And if ever you said to them, you just look like the Rolling Stones, they'd say, no, we don't. We're a totally original band. It's, you know. it's sort of like this phenomenon uh, on... Um, I'm always impressed by the phenomenon on, on my space of... Uh, bands that clearly belong to a, a, a musical tradition and then they they're always careful to to mark their genre as you know acapella trip hop um country mm. or something like that so they we no we don't have any influences mm. but see that's just ridiculous because you you know it, it's impossible not to, to have influences if you want to be a musician it's because you've grown up listening to music if you want to be an artist, it's because you've grown up being fascinated with art. I mean, it's 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 very hard not to be influenced by somebody who's inspired you. But I think, um, you know, to totally and utterly rip it off is uh, <laughs> is is a bit of a stupid thing to do. And I'm just wait. I'm just waiting for. I'm waiting for a new band to come along who who I look at and listen to and get really excited about and think, wow. Because the idea of being in a band, a really great band, is it's, it's a very cool thing, and if, if it's genuine and and and, and done right, and you, and you believe in these people, then it's it's really exciting. And it's been years since I felt like that about a band. I can remember when I was younger, always feeling like that, but uh, I haven't had that. I haven't had that excitement about a new band in a long time. Do you think that's because? The music has changed, or do you think that's just because you're you're no longer, you know, at that formative period in your life where bands can mean everything? Yeah, I mean, it's just because I'm an old git who's <laughs> 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 lost the, lost his spark. Um, no, I think it's because I've been uh, I've been around long enough to have seen it happen, just to see the sort of the circle that it goes in. That you know, you know every. Every ten years, it seems to repeat itself. So I've sort of seen it repeat itself two or three times now. It's, so maybe I'm a little bit cynical about it. But it, it doesn't mean that I don't, you know, love music and make the effort to go out and constantly buy new records and listen to what's going on and be aware of what's going on. Because you know, I'm waiting for something to come along that is, you know, 
I can honestly say, well, that's great, and I love it, and I'm going to go and see their, them play, and I'm going to buy their album. I'm not going to nick it off of the internet. <laughs> I'm actually going to spend some money on it. Let me ask you this. Um, you talked about that that experience of being in a really good band, and what it made me think of was, uh, it made me wonder uh, what the role of the you know graphic artist in a band is what is you what is your what is your role besides just you know illustrating that's it that's my role <laughs> <laughs> that's you know it's um it's um i can remember i mean there is a, there is a there is and there can be a role um for a graphic artist i mean i remember the clash their bass player paul Simonon, originally what well, is an artist and um, originally joined The Clash because not only did he look incredibly cool, but he was a great <laughs> artist and he sort of designed the whole look and, of, of The Clash and, 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 and of the band and then learned to play bass guitar very well and then became part of the band. And, um, you know, the, the difference with me is that I can't play any instruments, so <laughs> I just draw all the silly pictures. <laughs> But, so I'm sort of in a band, but without actually being able to play a note. But in hearing in hearing you talk about it, it, I feel like you're you're more invested in what this operation is and and what it means than simply that you know they they mail me the record and I draw a picture of it. Yeah, well, no, that's but that's yeah, that's very true. I mean, that's that is the sort of that is the way we work. Um, it's. It is a collaborative thing, although I don't get up and play instruments and stuff. I mean, um, I do work very closely with Damon, and, you know, I have a small studio with about 10 people who work for me. Damon has about four people in his studio, and then we we have a management company who sort of take care of that side of it. But everyone else works together and and, and shares ideas, and it's, it's a big sort of collaborative effort. So and most of the people who work on Gorillaz um, are friends of mine who have been pulled in because they have, you know, various different talents. I mean, the guy who does a lot of the writing for the characters now is a guy called Cass Brown, who is um, used to be a drummer in a band called The Senseless Things, who has been a friend of mine for about 15 years. But he not only is he a great drummer, but he just happens to be very intelligent and very funny and very good at writing. So it's like, right, can you do the writing? And then when Gorillaz play live, he's on the drums. So it's, everybody has sort of, you know, different roles to play. And it's, it's interesting that people are bought in, not necessarily because that's their specialist subject, but because, you know, the guys who do the voices to the characters are all friends of ours who just have no training in doing that. But they're funny people who we hang out with and we got them in. And it, it's, it's kind of a nice, it's a nice way of working. It's just like a big group of friends working together. One of the reasons you're on the show today is because uh, a, a book that's sort of a, an autobiography of, uh, or excuse me, a, um, a an oral history of the gorillas um, was just released called uh, Rise of the Ogre. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't looking at it. I had it on the side of me instead of in front of me. Um, and I wonder if, you know, you started the Gorillas in what, 1997 or 1998, something like that? Yeah, 99. And, 98, 99. And I wonder, you know, that's eight years ago now. Um, mm-hmm. I wonder if, you know, doing a kind of a big career-spanning operation like like the Gorillas book or gives you an opportunity to, to look back at the work that you've done in, in the way that you were just sort of talking about the way you've looked back at, at Tank Girl. Yeah, it probably does. I mean, I think um, a lot of the stuff that we attempt to do with Gorillaz is is, is usually we're, we're trying to think of new and clever things that haven't been done before. I mean, with some of the performances at the EMAs and, and the website is, is quite sort of cutting edge with a lot of the stuff that's in there and the videos. And pretty much everything we've done on Gorillaz has been sort of, you know, um, breaking new ground, I think. But doing a book is a pretty normal thing to do, and everybody does it. And um, 
we just thought it would be a really nice way of because we've done two albums now and and our next <clears throat> our next venture with Gorillaz isn't necessarily going to be another album in the sense of in the same sort of style as what we've done we, we want to try and do something different so we thought it would be nice to collect together all the stuff that we've done in a book because most of the illustrations and interviews and stuff appear in magazines and then you don't see them again and you know a lot of people will just have you know in 10 years from now a lot of people will probably just have the Gorillaz album with the sleeve missing at the bottom of their record collection and that'll be their only memory of Gorillaz so we thought it'd be nice to sort of put a book out that is something that you could you know 10 years from now you could slide off your bookshelf and, and look at all the stuff that we did so it would be just sort of be really nice to collect it all together, and because um, we'd written this whole backstory for the characters and, and actually given them all lives and stuff, and and a lot of it had just been it had appeared in snippets in magazines or interviews, and it was all very disjointed and and but it did exist in in a, in a sort of a, a linear form, and so we wanted to sort of bring it all together. At the same time, that kind of makes you responsible for it in a funny way, doesn't it? Mm, totally. We are completely responsible. <laughs> you actually have to make sure that everything makes sense in there. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't believe the <laughs> the amount of detail that's gone into getting it all right. Yeah, it's, um, it was... Yeah, it was a big undertaking to do because it, it's, it's a big book and it's got a lot of stuff in there, but it's just... It was um, just a really nice thing to do in the end. It was... Uh, just a nice thing to have and hold at the end of the day, you know, sort of a memory of, of, of what we did. You alluded to the next project not necessarily being an album. Um, there's been a lot of talk about feature films for like five years at this yeah. point. What's, what is the next project for the gorillas? What's the story? Well, we've, the feature film thing is something that, we've always wanted to do but um, I think the last time we sort of set out to attempt to do it um, we didn't feel like we were in a position to do what we wanted to do because animated film is an expensive undertaking and um, it's very hard to sort of put across the sort of story that we would want to do without you know getting money from people who wouldn't necessarily want us to tell the sort of story we want to tell so we pulled out from that idea and thought, you know, we'll get back to this another time. And um, this is this has come back round again now, and this is sort of what we want to do next, is we want to find a way of actually making an animated Gorillaz movie that, um, you know, the, the, the score would in fact be the third album. And that's pretty much all I can say about it without giving away... Um, the details, but we have a storyline and we, we have that all sussed out, but we're just in the process of figuring out how can we make this and how can I have final cut over my film and how can we do this without, you know, the wrong sort of people becoming involved and, and, and sort of sabotaging it because the sort of story we want to tell wouldn't be your your average sort of happy singing, dancing sort of animated kids feature it would be probably quite a dark weird funny film so but I think you know we're in a better position now than we were four years ago to achieve that and there are people interested and we, but you know we're talking to people and it's sort of moving forward but um, ultimately I'd like to make a really great animated film well Jamie thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be on The Sound of Young America thank you very much it's been, it's been a pleasure Jamie Hewlett is the co-creator of the animated band The Gorillas. They're on the internet at gorillas.com, spelled with a Z. Their lavishly illustrated fictional autobiography is called Gorillas: Rise of the Ogre. It's in bookstores now. That's our podcast. I've been your host, Jesse Thorne, America's radio sweetheart. The show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our theme music was written and performed by Dan Grayson with some help from myself. And our interstitial music was composed by DJW. You can find a link to his website at ours. If you have any thoughts about the program, visit us at MaximumFun.org. 
Email me directly at jesse, J-E-S-S-E, at MaximumFun.org, or give us a call, 206-984-4FUN. That's 206-984-4FUN. We'll see you next time. The Sound of Young America is proud to sponsor the 2007 San Francisco Sketch Fest. The 6th Annual Festival features the best stand-up, sketch, and improv comedy from around the nation and runs January 11th through 28th in San Francisco. This year's festival includes Paul Rubens, Stella, Bruce McCullough, the cast of Mystery Science Theater 3000, and much, much more. Tickets are on sale now, and you can find more information at sfsketchfest.com.